good evening, everybody, and welcome to Civil War Digital Digest, to our every other week live stream that we've started in the COVID-19 era. I want to say hello to everybody out there, and especially want to welcome tonight's guest, Mr. Ron Coddington from Military Images Magazine. Good evening, Ron. Hey, Will. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, sounds like you and I both have a little bit of a secret to tell everybody, and that is... I don't care whether you're out in Arlington, Virginia, or whether you're in Washington Township, Michigan. The weather stinks tonight. <laughs> There's some thunder and clouds, some heavy-duty thunder and clouds out there. <laughs> yeah, we've got pretty much the same thing here. So just a fair warning yeah. to just a fair warning to everybody. Um, if you lose one or both of us, there's probably a good reason we'll try to get back, but see what it's up. Saying good evening to Blair, good evening to Rich. Welcome. We see people starting to check in. As we're all separated from each other, it's really great to have a chance to get together and visit and to share some good history. Ron, as we see people checking in, would you just take a minute and introduce yourself to the Civil War Digital Digest audience? Sure. Uh, I'm Ron Coddington. I am the editor and publisher of Military Images Magazine. Uh, the magazine has been around for 40 years, and uh, I'm honored to be the fourth uh, editor in that position. I have a, um, a long-time interest in Civil War since I was a kid. I uh, started collecting when I was uh, 14, and uh, that collecting ultimately fueled a uh, passion for research, for writing, uh, it turned it to some books, and uh, now the magazine. Fantastic. Well, I must say we're going to save some yeah. stuff and talk about books later on because there's stuff to talk about. Let me ask you something that's a big point of all of our live streams here. What are you drinking this evening? Uh, this evening, uh, I have a fine porter. Uh, this is a Black Butte from Oregon. Uh, I like to experiment with my porters, and this is the first time I recommend it. Cool. Good to hear. Well, I've switched it up the last couple of times. I've been drinking whiskey, uh, usually Woodford Reserve. Uh, missing my buddy Andy Roscoe this evening. I figured I'd go for a scotch, and I'm doing a Balvenie 12 year double wood. So. Ah, good for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, gang, I see people jumping in this evening. This will be a little bit different than other Digest uh, live streams in that we may not take questions quite as often, but we will get to them. Uh, as with any of our presentations, Ron and I have talked ahead of time, and he brought the idea to us, and so he's got a uh, layout, and we're going to talk about Cardomania tonight and tell you a little bit more what that is. We will get back and forth, throw the questions in the, um, in the comments section. I'll take them at some intervals that we've got pre-set out. Uh, hello to Carol Coddington. Ron, I think that's going to be somebody you're going to be able to say hi to here. Oh, hey, <laughs> hey, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I and, I, and, I, and I see other friends of mine uh, from the collecting community uh, that are here. So, hey, everybody. I saw Liz Topping. Uh, uh, yes, and other folks. Good. Wonderful. A uh, little bit of housekeeping details. How can we afford to keep doing this? Well, Ron is gracious enough to join us. And a lot of the machinery behind the things here and things that keep Civil War Digital Digest going, um, we're now more and more funded by our patrons on Patreon. And we just got to say thanks uh, to all of them for what they do month in and month out. Those who feel like supporting us, pick a, a financial amount that makes sense for them on the Patreon website. Our group, we call them the CWDD Coffee Grinders. And this time we have one new person joining since the last live stream. Christian Gear, thanks so much and welcome to the Coffee Grinders. I know I've seen several of the other folks who I've seen here already saying hi. Uh, Andrew Plevin so, and Chris Harward for sure. I see a couple of Coffee Grinders already uh, checking in on the live stream. So... Well, Ron, as we think about things, if I think about the word cardomania, I sure think of something out of the modern day. I don't think about the Civil War. You want to go ahead and start us off and get us going? Yes. Uh, I'll get to that term uh, partway through the presentation, um, but I'll start with a, a classic question to, to set this up, Will. Uh, what if photography hadn't been invented until 1866. Uh, I think what we would have probably have had, uh, we would be relying on engravings from uh, newspapers, uh, from the illustrated newspapers, from the magazines. Uh, you'll be seeing some examples uh, of how that works. Uh, you've got uh, folks, uh, we've got a, a plate from Harper's Weekly uh, showing uh, barrel-chested Robert E. Lee 
Uh, we have uh, Stonewall Jackson kind of looking like my fifth grade math teacher. Uh, and uh, that's how Americans might know uh, these folks. I've got another plate here of, uh, of William Tecumseh Sherman looking rather benevolent as, uh, as he's sitting in camp. Uh, these are the kind of images that the American public might have seen. Um, I'm also going to show you, uh, there's a plate here of uh, the Battle of Rich Mountain. This is another engraving. You'll see Old Rosie, uh, General William S. Rosecrans. He's seated on his, uh, it's like a white charger. Uh, he's got his uh, dress hat up in the air. Uh, he's uh, cheering the men onward. The artist who made this engraving took great pains to get Rosecrans's, uh, Old Rosie's facial features looking correct, or at least as correct as could be based on what he had heard. All of the other uh, soldiers in that engraving, I want to just pause for a second and look at them. Um, these are likely creations from the artist's imagination. Uh, they were not necessarily real soldiers. So the bottom line here is, had photography not been invented, we might never have seen what your as your average soldier looked like. So uh, moving on, of course, we do see that it's uh, Rosecrans. We also, because we have photography, we get to see that Sherman wasn't necessarily the most uh, benevolent looking guy. Uh, you've got Stonewall Jackson, uh, who is looking a bit more serious than my fifth grade math teacher. Uh, you've got Robert E. Lee. Of course, you've got some iconic portraits uh, that are happening here. Because we have photography, of course, we know what the common soldier, the privates, the corporals, uh, what those guys who are in the ranks, the junior officers, we know what, what they look like. And so uh, we're going to go through the next group here um, and just give you a picture of some of these portraits Remember their faces, because later on in the presentation, we're going to come back and visit uh, visit these folks. So you've got a guy here standing, uh, wearing a broad-brimmed hat. Uh, cavalryman has his gauntlets on. We have uh, clearly a Confederate soldier who is leaning on what might be a Bible uh, on a column. Uh, we have uh, a major in the uh, U.S. colored infantry. We have a Union officer uh, posed with his uh, field glass case and some other prized possessions. Uh, we have a Confederate officer uh, with his arms folded and uh, a beard that would... Uh, make many soldiers probably envious. Uh, we have a naval uh, officer who is uh, maybe doing something of an Abe Lincoln impression. Um, and uh, then we have a nurse, uh, pardon me, a nun, who uh, you'll find out uh, became a nurse a little bit later on. Hmm. So, fair to say, that all these folks are part of the photography generation. And when you think about it, uh, photography was 22 years old in 1861. And uh, that may st that's the infancy of this technology. So now we're going to take a look at some folks, some faces that you know, just to get a sense of how old they were when photography was invented. Now, I didn't tell you the date. The date, the year is 1839. Um, and for those of you who are photo enthusiasts, you know this information already. Um, but you may not realize Abe Lincoln was 30. Frederick Douglass was 21. Clara Barton was a teenager, 18. U.S. Grant, also a teenager. Your average Civil War soldier was four. And uh, George Armstrong Custer was one, and he's really the first, that first generation that truly grew up with photography from the very beginning, which might explain why he's, uh, he, he understands uh, photography maybe like other folks didn't. Um, so 
<laughs> if you want to get to the, uh, the, the, the details, a little bit of detail, I'll give you a quick lesson uh, on early photography for those of you who hey, are not. Uh, hey, Ron, can, yeah. I, can I break in for yeah. just a second here? We hit our first pause sure. and a lot of folks have checked in. Uh, Jim Scheidel has said, hey, there's a white charger under, under old Rosie. Good target. Folks are checking in, saying huh. where they're from. We see Michigan, Tennessee, Virginia, Georgia. Uh, Dylan Jost, who if you uh, actually, Ron, you would recognize Dylan's face because he plays the erstwhile assistant to Lieutenant Crowley in Hold My Horse. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, I love the film. Uh, sure. Well, hey, Dylan, Dylan. Dylan asks, why are some of their coats unbuttoned? Was that a style? And yeah, Dylan, that was definitely, you'd see that. Uh, Ron, do you want to talk to that in a photographic sense? Uh, yeah, um, I think um, uh, a lot of it was, or part of it was that they were um, they were mimicking what they saw uh, in portraits. Remember, these guys uh, are what do they see before they pose for the photograph? What did they see growing up? They saw oil paintings, uh, they saw engravings. So they're imitating what they see, but they're also imitating their peers. Uh, and um, Will, you may have some something to offer there too about uh, wearing the uniform on the field and, and how the comfort level was with them. Well, sure. A couple of things. One, um, those of you who are watching the live stream, what Ron couldn't see because he's seeing me on Skype and delayed, uh, you saw me put my hand in my shirt with my fingers in. We call it the Napoleon. It's a painting. It's a pose that we often saw Napoleon in when he was standing where he had his fingers in his jacket or on his chest. And so that's something that's popular. Uh, speaking of somebody who's built quite a number of jackets over my days, I can tell you and has and does photography for a living, you want to make that person look really good. Um, and the jacket, when it's cinched up, is going to do things like stay closed, but it may not lay as well. And sometimes if you unbutton a couple of buttons, either on the top or on the bottom, you're going to get the garment to lay a little bit better. Or for the photographer or the person, you may see that fancy cravat that was bought by a sweetheart, or you may see the watch fob that, if you look at an earlier Civil War Digital Digest episode, we talk about how hair jewelry was a way to have a memory. You may have been able to see the hair fob that we don't know, but could have been some Somebody's loved one's hair that was sent to a city to be woven. So there's a number of both sentimental, practical, and photographic reasons why it might be done, Dylan. I think I'll also add, um, I've noticed images where a soldier might be wearing a great coat or a cape of some kind and have it moved over to the side to show their shoulder strap. So sometimes there's things that they want you to see well, uh, and, they're, and they're going to change the way they're dressed to show you that. Well, Dylan's going to know that because he had to put up with Lieutenant Crowley for a couple of days on set, and that's exactly <laughs> where some of that's going to fit. So yes. um, let me, before we go too far, uh, Chad Carlson asks, how common was it to take a CDV of a tintype or ambro photo? Um, using one process to do the other, is that something you can speak to? Uh, yes, it really starts uh, at the end of the Daguerrean era uh, when the tintype and the ambrotype uh, become popular. That's in the late 1850s. Photographers begin advertising their services as copiers. Uh, so it's a new line of business for them. Uh, and that continues. The carte de visite, of course, uh, ultimately becomes more popular than the tintype and the ambrotype and the idea of copying. Now, uh, people will also copy images because they want multiple copies. They'll also make copies if a soldier has um, uh, died in battle, died of disease, they'll create a memorial portrait based on that last tintype or ambrotype. And let me say, golly gee, we're going to get to that in just a little bit because I know what's coming yeah. up. So... Um, let's say this, I'm going to ask, I'm going to bring up one more question. And for those of you who are saying, Will, why are you reading the questions? We'll see them in the comments when the episode or when the live stream is done here, we're going to upload it to the YouTube channel. So, and those folks won't get to see them. Let me bring up one more question to you here, Ron, and we can either deal with it or punt it because it's going to work later in the conversation as well. TJ Casey All said, right. did the photos from Crimea play any role on how soldiers posed? Uh, well, you're about to find out. <laughs> yeah, so given that, let's use that as a segue in, Ron, and go ahead and whenever okay. you're ready, let's roll back into it. 
Sure, sure. Um, thanks for the great questions, everyone. Um, uh, we'll go to Daguerre. Um, this is the man who was credited with uh, inventing that first commercially successful uh, process of the daguerreotype. Um, the guy who doesn't get as much credit but deserves a lot of it uh, is Joseph Niepce. And uh, Daguerre is working off of ideas that Niepce and others had pioneered, uh, phosphorus chemicals, um, uh, the idea of reflecting uh, off of objects, the camera obscura, all of these pieces come together. Uh, Niepce is one of these great ironies. He played such an important role in photography, yet no photograph exists of him. Um, he died before Daguerre's invention. So we have this portrait of him, but no photographs that I can show you. Niepce uh, is known for this image, which many of you have probably seen, his view from the window at Le Gras uh, from the late 1820s. If you were to see the original, it is so dark, it's barely visible. I've had to jack up the contrast on this to a, a high degree to be able to get this view out of the window um, of, uh, of his home. Now, looking at one of the examples of Daguerre's uh, imagery, this is a shocker to the world when this invention comes out of France. When Daguerre puts it all together, uh, people are shocked. Uh, phrases like, no, no human hand could ever make such an image. They're floored by the artistry, the intersection of the sign uh, of science and technology. Um, folks are just mesmerized by this. France decides to gift the process to the world. This is not something to patent. This is something that we're going to give to the world in the interest of bettering society. So of all the wonderful things that are said about the daguerreotype and are still said about it, um, there's some things that are unsaid about it. And uh, this next slide is simply a reversal of the first one. Um, uh, the, the, the challenges here for the Daguerrean artist, the images were flipped because they had mastered the idea of um, showing the image the right side up. Uh, the big elephant in the room, there's no color. That would come decades and decades later. Uh, and another elephant in the room, this particular view of a boulevard in Paris, there's practically no one on it. Um, if you come up very close in the foreground corner, you'll see the boot uh, cleaner. Um, the boot cleaner and the guy who's getting his boots polished, they're perfectly still. They've been preserved forever. All of the folks that were in the street that were moving, those, of course, are not visible because the development time took so long. 1839, it comes out. Within a month, it lands in America. Uh, I've got a slide here of Matthew Brady's studio. He's one of many photographers uh, who embrace it. Brady comes up with this idea of having the gallery. Folks are coming in. They're posing. He makes a big, big business out of this. Photography also does a lot for businesses who were maybe started during colonial times and were trying to invent themselves. They were challenged by what was going on during the Industrial Revolution. And so what better place to jump in than with uh, all the supplies for photography? And you can see a sampling of those supplies here. Now... When you think about all those early Americans who were photographed, they are all photographed as daguerreotypes. John Quincy Adams, uh, sixth president of the United States, early picture of Frederick Douglass. These are daguerreotypes. You also have this image here, uh, one of the early images of Mexican War. This is the first war that's photographed, uh, our war with Mexico. What is important to know here is the war um, was not photographed systematically. Um, these are photographed photographers who might have been part of the army or traveling with the army. They might have been photographers in towns in Mexico and elsewhere um, who took 
one-off images of the Union armies and the officers and some of the enlisted men. So, back to America. We're taking a look. What do Americans do? We, we use technology and we make, it, we make things more affordable. So, uh, for those of you who study photo history, you're going to kill me because I'm taking 20 years of photo history and boiling it down into one 15-second slide. Uh, you can see over time, you've got the daguerreotype to the ambrotype to the tintype, uh, which early on was known as the ferrotype uh, or the melanotype. Um, we basically bring the price down to something that's much more affordable. We're democratizing photography. Great. Well... Uh, jumping back in here, we've got our next little pause here, Ron, and we just go, went ahead and checked off Mark Susness's question, which came in three or four minutes ago. Uh, good to mm -hmm. see you, Mark. Glad to have you with us. Chris Harward just asked, uh, and this is something you may know or somebody else may be able to chime in, how many photographers did Matthew Brady have working for him? A good question. Uh, I don't know that number offhand. Um, but uh, I know there was a fair number of assistants. Uh, I think most folks might know that uh, Brady himself uh, was not the guy to get behind the camera. Um, he, was, he, he was the out front guy who would uh, wine and dine and get you comfortable for the experience you're about to have and probably upsell you along the way. Well, there's no, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. And having worked with a photographer's assistant over the years, <laughs> Even though the guy I work with, my friend Aaron Kessler, would take the images, there's a lot of days where I looked at him and I said, give me the lights, give me the meter, tell me what you want for a ratio. You take the computer and the camera, hold their hands and yeah. get us more work. I'll go get everything else set up. So that's that. I, Things haven't changed in 150 years. It's it's a business. It, it is. It is. And it's a fun one. That's yeah. for sure. And it's great to be talking yeah. about it. Don't yes, see too many agreed. people chiming in with many more things. Let's go ahead and go back off to the races. All righty. Uh, so meanwhile in Europe, uh, we have this, uh, I'm calling it a radical new photographic format. In fact, uh, this format uh, invented by this man, William Henry Fox Talbot, comes out about the same time as a daguerreotype. Problem is... Um, it isn't quite of the same quality of the Gary type. He has this novel idea of making prints off of a paper negative. Um, it, it catches on somewhat in Europe, but the Gary type really remains quite popular, especially in America. Americans love their Gary types. Around 1850, this next guy comes into play, Frederick Scott Archer. Um, he gets rid of the paper negative and substitutes glass. Uh, he introduces a new chemical cocktail, uh, collodion. And uh, all of a sudden, you've got these great quality prints, which gets to the earlier question about the Crimean War. Uh, look at a couple of examples that I'm showing you here. Now you begin to see uh, soldiers uh, who are posing together in their natural environment. Uh, or their warlike environment in the Crimea. And um, uh, this is, by the way, the first systematically uh, photographed war, as opposed to the Mexican War. You've got the Crimean War. You've got a lot of photographs that have survived to tell that tale. Now, I'm going to introduce you to a key player in the carte de visite. This, uh, this is Desdari. Um he is uh, sort of, a, he's a, I want to call him a failed Shakespearean actor, which might explain the pose here. Um, uh, he also uh, is uh, paying attention to what's going on in photography. And um, while, he, while the 1850s are going on, jokes are starting to uh, circulate about, gosh, photographs are everywhere. And uh, you can put them on this, you can put them on that, you can put them on visiting cards. Desdari hears this, and so he patents a camera that has uh, four lenses, and the idea is he can work with um, uh, the technology used during the Crimean War, and he can put four images on a glass plate. You can break it into four parts, cut that paper print into four parts, put each of those pieces of print onto um, cardboard mounts, and you have visiting cards with the photograph of the person on it. 
of course, people laugh at this idea. I mean, this is this is this is folly. This is this is not the right thing to do. The cultural norms of the time, you put your signature, your fancy engraving on a visiting card, not your likeness. That all changes in the spring of 59 in Paris when uh, the Emperor Napoleon III and the Empress Eugenie, they walk into Desdari's Paris studio and they get their visiting cards, their carts to visit made, and uh, Paris goes crazy. If the emperor wants uh, his carte de visite, everybody's got to have it. The following year, in the summer of 60, in London, Albert and Victoria do the same thing. They get their photograph made in the carte de visite format. Everybody goes nuts. And of course, what happens in Europe is going to come over to the United States. And my friends, you have cardomania. Well, there so, we go. There, There's our title for the evening, gang. Um, jumping in real quick, uh, Andrew Plev out in California asks if we're other people having a choppy experience. It's not bad here, Andrew, so if you're having some chops, catch us on the YouTube to catch up things. There's a little break up here and there, and you're right, the weather is not being very cooperative with us, but I'm not having a real issue here. So, uh, Nothing else here, Ron. Let's pick back up with Cardomania. All righty, here we go. Um, I want to read you this quote from a photo historian that I think uh, captures the spirit of these images. Uh, they're small, ephemeral commodities that are widely available, easy to hold, easy to pass around, easy to look over by the dozen within a drawing room. Carts de visite possess little distinction in themselves. They are personal artifacts not to be looked at with deferential awe or revered from a distance, but cataloged and collected gossiped and commented upon and we're doing it 160 years later exactly and so this is facebook uh in the 1860s um these images are wildly popular by the time they've landed in the united states queen victoria has collected albums photo albums were invented to carry uh to hold carts to visit that were piling up in the parlors of everyone. Uh, there's great stories in America where these images are piling up in cabins uh, on top of primitive tables. Uh, and so it just takes off. Um, I've got an ad here from uh, showing the albums uh, offered for sale. All of this, of course, is going down as the Civil War is beginning. So you're at a really interesting time as far as technology is concerned around photography. Uh, flash forward to 1864, uh, you have Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great man of letters, uh, who proclaims that card portraits have become the social currency, the sentimental greenbacks of civilization. Now, I'm going to show you this chart just to give you a sense. Uh, daguerreotypes in green, you've got Ambrose and tintypes and CDVs. If you follow the red bar from 61 to 65, you'll see how the market becomes dominated by parts to visit or CDVs as uh, we collectors like to call them. Uh, Ron, let Ambrose in particular still remain extremely popular. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Ron, let me stop you for a second. We did have a pretty good bit of break up there. Will you describe okay. the uh, chart in front of us one more time, please? Sure, sure. Uh, what we're looking at here is a critical period in photographic history that overlaps with the uh, Civil War. You've got the carte de visite, or CDVs, as we collectors call them, gaining in popularity between 61 and 65. If you, if you follow the red bar, you'll see the steep rise of them. Uh, Daguerre types declining, um, Ambro types still remaining popular, tin types sort of sitting below the surface there. So it's a good chart to see to give you an idea that um, the technology is very fluid and carts de visite are beginning to take over the market. Great. Now you're gonna ask the question, why? Three big things to know. They're affordable. You can get a dozen for $1.50. That's way cheaper than anything else. Um, they're reproducible. 
you give those 12 to your friends, you go back to your local photographer, he gets out the glass negative and makes you another dozen. They're shareable, the Facebook idea, you send them around. So uh, you look at guys like General Banks, just to give you a sense of how many of these images were produced. You have uh, uh, General Banks, he hired one photographer to make 2,000. And of course, they were of him. <laughs> um, so that gives you a sense of the number that we're talking about. Um, uh, the next slide here is uh, uh, from a, a great book about Cars to Visit by Dara. Um, and uh, in his estimate, 300 to 400 million were made in England alone from 1861 to 1867. That's a massive number. If you bring that to America, I did a calculation to get a sense of how many Union soldier images were made during the war. Um, and when you count the duplicates that were made, the number that I get is 40 million. Wow, just wow. That's, that's mind blowing stuff. And I think that might even be a conservative estimate. Um, if only 10% of them survived, you're looking at 4 million images that are out there. And if you go on eBay, you'll see what I mean. Just do a search for CDB. Um, to give you some context around that, every two minutes in the world, we take as many photos as the total taken during the entire 19th century. Whew. Yeah. So. Well, let's just take I'm a sure Let's just take a second here, um, <clears throat> uh, not in our normal break, so I apologize there, Ron, but it seems like a reasonable break point. Um, had one question come in from a coffee grinder, Matt Tolan in northern Michigan. Uh, he said, when did stereoscope photography start to gain popularity? Hey, Matt, um, uh, that, that definitely um, gets popular uh, by my estimates in the 1850s uh, by the time of the Civil War. You are seeing carts to visit being made of uh, folks posing with stereo viewers. Uh, so the popularity is definitely there. In fact, in the latest issue of the magazine, um, we have a series of stereo views that were taken in, on July 4th, 1860, of the July 4th parade going through New York City. So by that time, they're certainly a commercial success. Fantastic. Okay, I can say, and yeah. I was thinking as we started to talk about it, you know, I don't think of them that often, but then you do find them regularly in the Library of Congress collection, so they've got to be there. I can think yeah, of one. Sure. I can think of one particularly we've used half of in the digest, and it is soldiers on picket near a fence line. One guy's laying down with his musket. Two guys are standing there, and there's an uh, ready at a ready and an officer behind. It's obviously staged, but it's a forward picket position or a skirmish position. Yeah, uh, getting back to the uh, to the CDVs, a group of four on a glass plate, there are actually two stereo views. If you could line up the top two and the bottom two, you've got You'd two have, stereo views. Absolutely. <laughs> Abs absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. there you go. Yeah. Well, hey, let's move on. Speaking of CDVs, I'm going to bring up your number 53, which will give you a chance to sort of let us know what's cool about a CDV here. Yeah, this is this is the dream. Uh, this is, if you're, if you're a collector and a researcher, this is the dream. Um, you've got a soldier who is in uh, fully armed, fully uniformed, standing at attention. Uh, the condition, uh, is fantastic. Subject is great. It has everything going for it, um, in terms of the image itself. Now on the back, it has everything you want smack in the middle. You've got the photographer, in this case, Gaylord and Spidell, uh, and um, they've got their imprints right in the middle. Below, below that, you've got a stamp, which tells you that this photograph was printed between August of 64 and August of 66, um, during which time a tax was levied on photographs to pay for the war. Um, below that, um, it tells you a, a friendly note from your photographer. All the negatives are preserved. If you want duplicates, we can help you out. He doesn't say it for a price, but of course they will charge you. Um, I'm sort of burying the lead here. At the top of the image, you'll see that uh, the soldier is identified. You've got his name, his rank, his company, his regiment, and 
in this case, the commanding officer has inscribed a personal note uh, of observation about uh, about the soldier. So you really can't ask for anything more. Very cool. Well, we had a quick breakup, gang, there. Uh, what Ron said when it broke below the uh, photographer's idea, that is a tax stamp. And, of course, he came back and was able to, and we were able to hear your description of what the, uh, the years the stamps were in place. Great. Okay. So. All right. Um, so should I continue with yeah. uh, the rest of the description? Yeah, 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 let's go ahead. Um, in, in, yeah, in the middle, we've got the um, photographer's back mark, his advertising mark. You had an internal revenue stamp below that telling you it was made to pay for the war between uh, August of 64 and August of 66. Uh, below that, a public service announcement from your photographer telling you that the negatives are preserved if you'd like to come back and buy more. And then uh, burying the lead at the top the name of the soldier, his rank, his company, his regiment, and a personal observation by the commanding officer. It doesn't get much better than that, Will. Ah, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Now, I don't want to forget about Amber types and tin types. You saw earlier in the chart, uh, the bar chart, that they're still being manufactured. They're still being made during the Civil War. Uh, and, of course, you they still have that same problem that the daguerreotype had, it's the reversal problem. And so uh, this soldier I'm showing you here, notice the color, they've added tinting uh, to his beard and to the buttons and the brass that he's wearing. Um, but just, and he's tried to compensate for the reversal effects. I've got a detail here that shows how the buckle, the belt is turned upside down. He's trying to get that U on the left-hand side. Uh, no matter that it's up, Upside down, he's got that U on the left-hand side. So those same problems exist. These guys are familiar with it. Uh, when you get to the detail showing his hat, he didn't really try to turn that D around, but you get the idea. Great. Yeah. Uh, you want to move on and uh, sure. take a look at... Uh, okay. Um, so I want to pause and just tell you about how, or take this next section to talk about how um, carts de visite, the role that they played, and how they help us today. Um, I'm going to go through these rather quickly, these images to show you. Uh, this first one is the Union Refreshment Saloon in Philadelphia. This is uh, playing off of the idea that you could mass produce these photographs and sell them to earn money. Uh, in this case, they earn money to support buying supplies for Union soldiers moving through Philadelphia. Um, this is basically using photography for philanthropic purposes. Uh, you have that great outside view. Now we're taking you inside. This is from one of the uh, sanitary fairs. You've got an inside view. You've got uh, Brownell who's posing uh, underneath a bunch of battle flags, a cannon. Uh, and these again were done for philanthropic purposes. You've got another image. Uh, these fairs were very popular. Um, you had folks dressed in uh, the garb of different company, uh, different countries, uh, different um, Native American groups. Um, the list goes on and on and on. Another use for philanthropy, this image, which I dare say everybody knows, uh, it's the children of the battlefield. Um, you know the story of Amos Humiston of the 154th New York. Uh, he dies on the battlefield clutching an amber type of young Frank, Frederick, and Alice. The image is unidentified. He's unidentified. Uh, a doctor launches a campaign to find their mother, uh, who is in, up in New York. Um, they collect money from the sales of these photographs. That money is given to the widow to take care of herself and her family. Additional money is raised to establish an orphanage in Gettysburg. Uh, the U.S. Medical Department, um, you've got to give these guys credit. In 1862, they realize how important uh, surgical developments are going to be to benefit the world. The surgeries that they're going to see from the complications of shell fragment wounds and bullet wounds. Uh, they, they, they want to document all of this. Early in the war, they're encouraging uh, surgeons to send in samples, but as early as 63, they begin to um, suggest 
that photographs could be used to show their more innovative and interesting surgical techniques. So this continues. In 64, they more or less say, hey, listen, we want you to send these photographs in. They're also used for legal purposes. Uh, I love this image. Um, a guy wearing a frock coat. Uh, the big A over his head tells you all you need to know. This is exhibit A in a case where this gentleman tried to avoid uh, the draft and uh, by claiming that the name on the envelope wasn't exactly his, it was misspelled. So they take him into court, the government wins the case, and this is exhibit A in that case. Also used for a bunch of uh, unusual events that you would never think of. Uh, here's one, uh, the fighting um, pastor, uh, the fighting Reverend Granville Moody, um, he is, uh, he marries a soldier and uh, autographs the back, or actually makes a wedding certificate out of his carte de visite. They're also used to document slavery. Um, you're going to see, Bill's going to share with you two slides here. You've got a before and after. Um, this is Hubbard Pryor who escaped slavery. You've got this before image that was taken of him in the clothes that he wore when he arrived in a camp in Tennessee. Uh, on the right side of that, you've got a Harper's Weekly engraving of that same image. Hubbard Pryor joins the 44th U.S. Colored Infantry. That's the next image you see here. Uh, interestingly enough, Harper's Weekly, when they made that pair of engravings, uh, they did not use this image of Hubbard prior in uniform. They clearly wanted to glorify the soldier. And so you see this more romanticized view in the, in the engraving. Another purpose you might not think of, um, you all probably are familiar with the models uh, of patents um, that uh, are on display in Washington, D.C. Well, photographers pretty much realize, wow, I've got another business here to photograph these models. Inventors realize it too. Um, in this particular example of an artificial hand with moving fingers, uh, you'll see the number two at the bottom. There's a series of four images that show how this hand works. Reminds me a little bit, we're a little bit in Star Wars territory there, Ron. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They were way ahead of the movie. They were. <laughs> um, the biggest, uh, a big, big chunk of all this, some of the, some of the best known images uh, were used by private soldiers. Um, they're badly wounded, uh, injured in battle. Um, they're getting a fairly meager pension and um, they cannot earn a living. They have families to support. So they begin traveling and telling their story and sending uh, and selling their photographs to help support that. You've got David Wintress who lost his eyesight. Um, uh, you've got, I'm gonna go through some of these images here. I also wanna show uh, Nick Biddle who was not, um, he's not uh, injured in a visible way. He didn't suffer an amputation, um, but he was wounded by a, a brick uh, coming through Baltimore in April of 61, and um, he sells his photograph and tells his story. Uh, you've got Catherine Lawrence, who adopts a slave child, who is Fanny, uh, next to her. They go around the North telling their story during the war, selling these photographs uh, to make money. You've got a sailor, um, double amputee, I believe this is at uh, Wilmington, again, selling his photograph. You've got another uh, naval image of father and son. Um, he suffered some amputations. They go around uh, making music with their music wagon and selling their photographs. Now, the reason that we really remember many of these photographs, uh, aside from the philanthropic reasons, is you look at um, the use to document death. Here we have a soldier in his coffin. He may have been embalmed. We're not sure what his cause of death is, but this ties into the Victorian traditions around mourning. Um, if you've read Drew Gilpin Faust's book, um, this idea of the good death where Americans need to know that their soldier died a hero in battle, a, a Christian um, hero, um, these kinds of images will document that. 
to one of the earlier questions about making copies of uh, photographs, here you have memorial photographs, two examples. Uh, Ellsworth on the left, this was mass produced. I have no idea how many tens of thousands were probably made. To the right is uh, a New Jersey um, soldier killed at Cedar Mountain. The family um, paid to have a custom mount made and printed with his name. And this, of course, was given out in memory of their son. Uh, and then you've got also an image here of a, uh, a wife, perhaps a mother, the family dog, a casket, uh, a sword, the stars, stars and stripes. Um, it tells a singular story. I'm going to show you to this one more image, uh, getting back to the idea of documenting. Um, tying back to what we started out this program with is um, the wonderful portraits of the common soldier, which you would not have seen um, had photography not been invented. Yeah. Well, Ron, before we go forward, let me pause you for just a second, because I know where we're heading into here, and I think that's going to be fun to go. Uh, let me just check in on a couple of questions here, if, if I may. Joshua Mann asks, are there any attempts at color photography during the American Civil War era? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I know that some of the Civil War photographers uh, and some of the soldiers who become photographers after the war, um, they go on to experiment with color lithography, color printing, um, uh, we'll get into um, how photographs begin to transition into the color era in just a little bit. Um, but during the Civil War, the focus is really on tinting. Um, that's where the bulk of the intellectual energy is going at that time. Sort of like that daguerreotype we showed the three sides of where the buttons and, and the beard are all tinted or painted. Yeah, Yep. exactly. Uh Yep. Exactly. Well, speaking of going forward and speaking of uh, soldiers who will become photographers after the war, let me throw a quick shout out to somebody who's thrown a uh, greeting into the comments section. Uh, Dave Rambo, who is both a Civil War Digital Digest coffee grinder and somebody you've seen on, on the channel before, says, hi, what an incredible program. Dave is the manager of the H.H. H. Bennett Photographic Studio for the Wisconsin Historical Society in the Wisconsin Dells and is a wet plate photographer himself. So as we got ready for this episode, we shared some of Dave's stuff to warm me up for Ron. So exciting yeah. to see the community as we do different things together and see different folks checking in. So that's really good. Um, one question here technically from Jordan Ricketts, Ron. Uh, when did they stop requiring the tax stamps? Uh, that would be in August of uh, 66 is when uh, they finally got rid of them. Uh, I'll spend just a minute telling you a very quick story. Uh, after the war, after the tax stamps are out for a while, um, the, the community of photographers eventually come to hate these things. They want to do their patriotic duty, but the stamps are hard to put on. They can, can ruin the photographs. Uh, the rules, there's a little bit of some blurred lines about uh, what had it, had it, had it affixed the stamps and how the tax um, schedule actually worked. So in uh, February of 66, the leading photographers of the country, Brady, Gardner, the Ben Dan brothers in Baltimore, um, other folks, they get together a group, they lobby Congress, and they get it overturned. They celebrate their victory by posing for a photograph. And I know that two copies of this image were sent for a publication called The Philadelphia Photographer. I don't know where they are, but that has got to be one of the most amazing images with all of the best photographers of the Civil War in their prime. I don't know where it is. Oh, Help me find it. <laughs> boy, okay, let's keep the shout out. That's one of the great things we can do in media is keep the word out. It would be amazing to find those. Yeah. And I think your magazine would be the right place to premiere them when we do. 
So yes, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm standing by. <laughs> okay, and as we go forward, thank you to Elizabeth Topping who chimed in with a response about the stereos to Matt Tolan's question. She said, "Stereos were a great way to see the world without traveling. Very popular entertainment in every middle and upper class home. Not too popular. Soldiers on the marches. You needed the viewer to see things in 3D, and it doesn't fit so well in the knapsack. I know. I've seen them both. I haven't tried it. It's not worth <laughs> trying. So." <laughs> Well, you know what, Ron? You started by showing us a whole bunch of faces. Shall we spring the story on everybody at this point? Yes. Um, I'm ready for you, Will. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's, um, I, I want to go back to these images that we saw um, uh, up front. And um, what, I, what I like to do is put context around these images. We talk about the quality. We talk about what they're wearing, how they pose, the equipment. Um, there's also the personal stories. So I'm going to run through these half a dozen images and um, put, put names to faces and experiences. So uh, our first uh, soldiers are cavalrymen. That's James Land in Fifth, Iowa, uh, captured near Atlanta in the summer of 64. Um, he is imprisoned in Andersonville and survives. Uh, Kirkbride Taylor, 8th Virginia Infantry, uh, during Pickett's charge, he hit with a glancing blow uh, by a bullet. Um, years later, he survives. Years later, he dies, 1913, and uh, mourners at the funeral are noticing as they go by his open casket, they still see the unusual uh, conical indentation in the side of his head made by that bullet. Uh, Martin Robinson Delaney may, might be a name they're familiar with. Um, he is a strong activist in the antebellum era. He lobbies uh, Lincoln and the government for uh, officers of color to be allowed to serve. He eventually uh, receives a commission as a major, which is uh, how he is dressed here. Um, very late in the war, uh, he gets that commission. Um, he eventually becomes very active in South Carolina politics, dies in 1885. Great. Uh, uh, George Washington Norton, first of oh, go ahead. I was going to say, you said we see here on uh, Delaney, Charlestown. Is that Charlestown, Virginia now? Charlestown, West Virginia? Or do we, do we know what state uh, he's out of? Uh, yes, uh, that is Charlestown, now West Virginia. Yeah. Okay. And would have been yeah. at the at the time would have uh, before the war would have been Charlestown, Virginia, before West Virginia split from Virginia. Correct. All yeah. right. Cool. Good point. Thanks for noting that. Yep. Um, George Washington Norton, First Ohio Light Artillery. Uh, he's posed here with uh, the spurs uh, that he was given and an ornamental sword given by his uh, grateful men and his company after the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, they lost heavily. He survived, goes on to become a captain, musters out, survives, and lives until 1906. Uh, William Gaston Deloney, he is a, a lawyer from Athens, Georgia. Uh, I went to UGA, uh, so did he. Um, he's in Cobb's Legion Cavalry. He suffers a gunshot at Jack Shop, Virginia, um, and uh, he succumbs. He, be, he gets captured and uh, succumbs of his wounds in a, a hospital in Washington, D.C. Uh, George Work, um, He's uh, he's he's a school teacher who goes on to Wall Street and yeah, becomes hey, a Ron, big Ron, financial give me, success. Give yeah. me just a second here. The machinery is not cooperating. Okay, go ahead with Mr. Work. Okay, um, George Work. Uh, he's a school teacher. Goes to Wall Street. Does really well. Decides to give back um, to the country. Joins the Navy as a paymaster. In February of '64, his first assignment is on the Tecumseh. And he goes down with the ship at Mobile Bay uh, in August of 64. Okay. Uh, last uh, photo um, that we showed up front, Sister Ignatius Farley. Um, she's a Catholic sister of St. Joseph in Wheeling, uh, West Virginia. Um, she's caring for the sick and wounded soldiers, um, spends most of the war doing that, and she becomes uh, one of the last surviving nurses when she dies in 1931. Great. So I think there's a real power there in 
bringing together these images uh, with the faces, pardon me, the faces and the names. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about some efforts that we're doing to try to make more of that possible uh, in just a few minutes. Great. Yeah. So um, uh, these portraits, they sort of disappear after the Civil War. But as the regimental histories start to become popular, as the veterans want to begin talking about uh, their life, their services, their contributions, um, that coincides with the development of halftone printing, which allows photographs to be reproduced in books for the first time. So we're now in the 1880s. Uh, so you see books with these images. So the photographs are beginning to get some attention. Around the same time, actually even earlier than that, you've got um, uh, Albert Ordway and uh, Arnold Rand, two Massachusetts officers. They begin building this massive collection, uh, 40,000 images, which becomes the Mollus collection. So Ordway and Rand, in my mind, they're the first two collectors uh, of Civil War photographs, <laughs> uh, if you don't count the families. So um, a lot of the images stay in the families. Um, I've got this photograph here of a three generations uh, of soldiers. A lot of these images stay in the families, uh, but folks start to lose track of who, who's that man in the album with the blue uniform or the gray uniform. It begins to fade from uh, America's consciousness. We begin to lose connection with them. This last section on pioneers, uh, this describes a lot of folks who are still active collectors today who began in the 1960s. Uh, uh, my friend Ross Kelbaugh calls them the centennial generation. And uh, Bruce Catton, you got to thank him for this. Um, his writing, which historian David Blight says, uh, Catton's works became a national siren call into the past to the distant sea or the scenes of a distant but deeply resonant war. Um, he tells the story of the Civil War in such a way. Uh, and then you have folks that I've interviewed who um, were, uh, who began collecting at that time. You've got Rich Jan, um, who says, there was a kid in my neighborhood and he had a big tray of Civil War photos. That must have been the late 50s, maybe 1960. They don't know what they have, but they have something. Uh, then you've got Bill Turner, the late Bill Turner, who was a prominent Confederate collector. Back in the early 60s, uh, when guns and uniforms became a popular collectible, uh, he says about photographs, hell, we used to give them away for free. Buy a gun, we give them a picture of a soldier with the gun they just bought. Uh, so the images are not really seen as having value, maybe a financial value, but they have a value attached to other goods. That soon changes as they begin to come into their own. Uh, there's a, the, the dealers begin to realize that folks will pay for them. So uh, I had to throw in my first image uh, just, to, uh, just because I still have it, and it still means a heck of a lot to me. Um, what I thought I had bought, I was 14 at a flea market. Um, this, uh, I thought I had bought a Civil War soldier. Um, what I really bought was a naval officer. Uh, his name is George Washington Garlic, and this is a um, post-war copy in the cabinet card format, which is uh, a five by seven format that eventually replaced the carte de visite. So this is also the first soldier that I, or first sailor that I researched. Um, uh, Will was kind enough to mention Military Images Magazine, and I talked about it um, in the intro. Um, Military Images Magazine plays a role in all this. It comes out in 1979 at a point when the photo collecting community, uh, they've got these images, they're desperate to learn more about them, and publications like Military Images for Photographs, uh, North South Trader for Relics, all of these uh, magazines are coming out during that period of time to try to help collectors um, make sense of what they have. Quickly, you've got uh, the Ken Burns series. 
introduces a new generation to collectors. Uh, and that takes us really to where we are today. Um, in the digital age, you've got uh, the Lilinquist collection of images that have moved to the Library of Congress. Um, that's the first big massive movement of a photo collection since the Malls collection really to go uh, to Carlisle Barracks. Um, you have in the middle of this frame Civil War photo sleuth, uh, which I mentioned earlier about identifying photographs. Um, that's a partnership that Military Images has with Virginia Tech and the National Science Foundation to use um, face recognition technology to try to identify soldiers. And then, of course, social media like Facebook, which takes us right back to the carte de visite. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Uh, well, let me say a couple of quick questions here. Uh, two, really. One's a comment uh, about collecting, and that was Alton Bunn Jr. just chirped in and said, the soldiers' pictures I saw at Civil War shows are all $100 and up. There's no free CDV with a weapon purchased anymore. I can tell you that. <laughs> so, Not anymore. Nah, and if you I'm, can find that deal, take it. Absolutely. Well, Andrew Pleva asks, um, do we know how many studios were in the North versus the South? Um, I, I'd have to do a little bit of investigating. Um, uh, it's it, it certainly the northern studios far uh, outnumber the southern studios. If you want to dig into it a little bit, you think about the Civil War, the effect, effectiveness of the blockade um, and the invasion of northern troops into southern territory. A lot of those photographers were rendered unable to work because they were displaced or didn't have the chemicals to do their job. So that's why you have this disparity. Not only did the Union have so many more soldiers, they also had the photo supplies and the South didn't. So a lot of the Southern images that you see were taken very early in the war before the blockade became really effective and the invasion began, or at the very end of the war, during that time when the men, when, when the war was over, uh, and they wanted to have that one last image in uniform. Sure. Uh, let me ask this, uh, just as sort of a takeoff on that. The chemicals, do you know, are we able to domestically produce those, or are these things we're bringing in from overseas, the, the collodion and some? That's not something I know. And uh, Dave Rambo, if you're here in the chat still, if you want to chirp in as well, you may, from your research, know. Do you have any knowledge, Ron, about where we get the chemicals from? I, I do not. Okay. Uh, that's probably a Dave. That's a Dave question. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see if he's still here and if he has that information. If he does, hopefully he'll share it. Even if we have to bounce it on later on. Uh, last segment, Ron. Yeah. Um, uh, we're now in that time period of the post Civil War. Uh, pardon me, post Centennial Generation. Um, and the question that I have that I want to answer, and I hope you can help answer, is uh, how will we remember the Civil War? And uh, my own take on this, we all have our own takes. Uh, I go back to Thomas Carlyle, the uh, British historian, in his uh, essay on history. He says, history is the essence of innumerable, bi innumerable biographies. And I love that expression. My own version of that is uh, the history of the Civil War is the stories and images of men and women who served. And we certainly, be, thanks to you, Ron, have been able to meet at least seven of them and get an introduction to many, many more of them this evening, which is always fun for me. You know, for me, it's you can do you can do the three hour the three hour mini series on Grant, and you could spend multiple hours. I love hearing, and I've got nothing wrong with that, uh, other than some yeah. material culture questions, but we can deal with that at another time, <laughs> and we'll probably yeah. deal with that when we do a live stream about uh, media, modern media and the Civil War. Shane Seeley and I have been talking about it. Sounds like Brian Egan from the Henry Ford probably will join us for that, but telling these stories, meeting Excellent. the one-off, the stuff that you've got here. I mean, I was struck the Confederate cavalryman from Cobb's Legion looking at him with his arms crossed. And I'm like, wow, he got the Confederate issue beard uh, for the cavalryman to go right with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there really is something when you, uh, what I really like about uh, reading their stories and researching their stories is it helps me be a better student of the Civil War because I get to understand um, the various 
military, political, social threads that were all wrapped up that they were participating in. Um, and just getting a sense of the context and the perspective, uh, it just helps me better appreciate what they went through. And it helps me understand what our country is all about. Um, and so I, I, and I can't think of a better way to learn. Con context and perspective, really wonderful. Well, let's turn yeah. let's turn the corner right here, uh, and I see a new uh, wet plate photographer just got tagged here. T.J. Casey tagged uh, Grant Kirk. Well, it would be great to hear him chirp in at some point. Folks are starting to say thanks. Um, let's say this: we always do at the end of these live streams. We do something. Andy Roscoe just uh, congratulate us, and he knows this is up and coming. Ron, we always talk about one cool thing going on for all of us. What's your one cool thing? All right, and 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 it's Civil War. Um, I I got my my latest uh, the latest addition to my collection is uh, and and I, I I don't know if I mentioned this. I'm I'm a I'm a carte de visite nut. I I loved them since I was 14 years old. Um, we we totally is, we totally missed that, Ron. Did, did, we couldn't did, yeah, figure did, that out. Did, did, did you not get that? <laughs> um, this is the latest. I made a printout here uh, to show it uh, show it better. This is the latest addition to my collection. Uh, the gentleman down here in the corner. And the reason it's cool to me is that there's research to be done here. There's a challenge. Um, we know who he is. Uh, this is Alfred von Kleiser of the New York Independent, 30th New York Independent Battery. I'm assuming that these are his uh, fellow commanders around him. Um, but what you may not know about uh, von Kleiser and his battery is uh, at Newmarket in 1864, he had to leave two of his cannon um, on the battlefield. One was disabled and one I think was overrun at one point. Uh, and the VMI cadets are the ones that captured uh, his cannon. Um, wow, so okay. When you, when, you, when you get into stories, I really wanna dig into his life and find out how did he get to be on the battlefield what was it like for him? Who are these other men? Why are they all together? And he's the other side of the story because the cadets capturing the guns are something we know, but they're just Union guns. We've, right. now, we've now got a face and a human yeah, yeah, to those pieces of metal. Exactly. And so my job is going to be to connect the dots and look. I, I, I want to turn that little part of the battle, the capture of those guns, I want to turn them around Let's look at it through another prism. Absolutely. That, that's, what, that's what keeps me going. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, before I ask you one more question, Ron, I'll share my one cool thing, and it's history-related, but not directly, and I should have brought the book up. While we were cleaning the basement, because while well, you're catching up on t honeydew list stuff like that during COVID-19, I found a copy of a cookbook that I didn't realize I still had. Greenfield Village has Eagle Tavern, which is an 1850 way station from southern Michigan that they've restored as their restaurant. They re have released several cookbooks over the years. The 1988 cookbook is considered the absolute best. It has both the original recipe and their version of the recipe. And for a second time tonight, I did a ham uh, for that. And then we did strawberry uh, and pulling out of that recipe book is great. Then we did a strawberry rhubarb pie. We were able to go up to the farm that I grew up on and brought rhubarb back from there. So it was, um, I'm ready for some food coma after we're done here. <laughs> so. Oh, 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 nice, nice. I see I'll, some, be, I'll be right over. <laughs> yeah, please, please do. I, I absolutely would love to sit down to dinner and a glass of wine or a porter with you. Uh, we see some uh, faces checking in when we talk about the hobby. Uh, Do, uh, my good friend Dom Del Bello from uh, California checked in. We see folks from Alaska. Uh, Elizabeth Topping says, Ron is a great storyteller. John Harris is checking in from Tennessee. Um, let's see. Barry Davis just checked in. This was a great program. Last week I was watching a Facebook Live in the Baseball Hall of Fame, the history of cards. It seems like the rise of CDVs during the Civil War helped the later popularity of early baseball cards. I see you nodding your head. You want to throw anything in there, Ron? Uh, I was a baseball card collector before I started collecting cards. Uh, I, we're actually talking. I, I'm, I'm working on a piece right now to see if we can't connect the dots between those early tobacco trading cards. Uh, and CDVs. I don't know if that's uh, if that is that's a theory, but I don't know. We haven't investigated it fully yet, but uh, that's on my list of things to do. Well, that's pretty cool. And you said we're working on it. That allows me to turn to the final place I go to. I want to go tonight, 
there's absolutely no way I can let you leave without doing an advertisement. We opened with a pitch saying, hey, gang, please join the Coffee Grinders and the Patron. Ron, yeah. your turn. Finish up. Talk to us about military images and how we can help you. Oh, thank you. Um, military images is uh, it's a family operation, um, and uh, we are uh, supporting the Civil War collecting community, uh, supporting the reenacting community by giving them images to give a sense of what your impressions can be like. Um, we try to make history accessible. We put a lot of emphasis on that. I also want to be sure that we're not uh, we're not repeating what you see online. You talked earlier about context and perspective. Um, that's what we try to do with the magazine. And we've broadened a bit too, to think about the full generation, not just soldiers um, and sailors, to talk about the folks, the nurses, uh, the families and their contributions. So that's the work that we do. And um, we love your support whether it's a subscription, a gift subscription, um, to help us do what we do um, would be really wonderful. You can go to militaryimagesmagazine.com. And um, in fact, I'll, I'll share a link. Uh, I, in fact, I can tell you right now the promo code. If you go to uh, shopmilitaryimages.com, use the promo code photo collector, and uh, you'll save 25% off of anything you buy. We have the single issue of our summer issue, which just came out. Oh, and by the way, I have a copy of it. I Surprise. don't even, I don't, <laughs> I, I, I subscribed about four months ago before oh, Ron and I started talking. I don't even yeah. have a copy yet. I'm looking, it'll be here soon. Yeah, summer issue is out. Um, so uh, the promo code photo collector, uh, go check us out. Um, the really important thing is we're trying our hardest to do three things. Our mission is to showcase to interpret and to preserve Civil War photography. So um, anything you can do, whether it's subscribing, whether it's getting involved as a collector, um, whether it's getting involved as a reenactor um, to help tell those stories and preserve those images, that's what we're all about. Perfect. Well, that's a great yeah. way to leave, and I couldn't wrap it up better. Ron, if you'll hang with me for a little bit, everybody else, thank you so much for joining us, for the comments, for everything coming in. Uh, if you missed any part of this, we will upload it in the next hour or two, whatever it takes with the Wi-Fi stream to YouTube, and you'll be able to see it there. So for Civil War Digital Digest, I'm Will. For Military Images, we were graced by the, by the guest of Ron Coddington. We'll see you guys all later. Have a wonderful evening.